Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in Ireland and the first time in Dublin. Uh, and I'm happy to share my experiences and my and to discuss it with you. My experience is with the Happy Lab. The Happy Lab is a fab lab. It was the first fab lab in Austria. We uh, opened it uh, four years ago. Ah, okay. So this is my colleague and also co-founder of Happy Lab, Karim, and myself. And we, as I said, we founded it four years ago. Uh, we both are researchers in robotics, or used to be researchers in robotics and artificial intelligence. And we had that time a an international research project with Bratislava, uh, between Bratislava and Vienna, uh, working on, on robotics and making robotics public because we thought that it's a, a good interdisciplinary subject where you can uh, motivate young people to, to, to work with robots. It's easy to see something moving, something strange, and, and, and make them happy just by trying out technology. Uh, and therefore, we opened a, an open robotics laboratory in, in Vienna. And after three years, the project was over. And we had some tools and machines in this lab, but it didn't work very well. And uh, we saw that there is a demand. Or many people uh, want to make use of these machines, but they're usually not in the robotics field. And that was the reason why we just renamed it and made a fab lab, fabrication laboratory out of it. And, but before I go into more details about the fab lab, let me go back uh, quickly in the history about, uh, so in history we had several big changes in economy and in industry. Uh, about 200 years ago, we had the first industrial revolution. It started in, as you might know, in, in England uh, with a, uh, automatic loom machines and, and the steam engine, which made possible to, to, to export and import worldwide. And a lot of uh, workers lost their jobs and they wanted to burn the machines. And, and we know all this, and it was a dramatic change. Uh, and about 100 years, no, about 100 years later, uh, again, the so-called second industrial revolution with a, a mass production conveyor belts, uh, electri electricity, uh, combustion engines, and so on. Uh, again, uh, the entire industrial system collapsed and changed and improved and was completely new. And, uh, and now, again, we are in, a, in, a, in an era of change. Uh, we all know that in the last two or three decades, uh, the computers uh, the personal computers arrived on our desks, and uh, the internet connected us worldwide. Uh, and it's, again, a, a big change. Uh, but the question is whether this is already a, the next industrial revolution. And I, I would say no, no but, because uh, it is not because it's, it's in the world of bits and bytes. And the world of bits and bytes, the, the, the weightless economy, is an important and a growing part of our economy, but just still just a small part. Uh, we all are sitting on chairs, driving cars, living in houses. So our world is a world of rather atoms than bits and bytes. Uh, what we are facing now is uh, that, like, like the computers became accessible to us, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I mean computers are much older. But before, the computational power was not accessible to us. There were big computational centers in, in the industry, in research centers, in governments. But we didn't have access. And the first computers, the first personal computers were, were rather useless uh, for us. But when they became available to us, then uh, a, a dynamism started and, uh, and, and, and uh, software uh, became developed and, and, and uh, applications uh, became available. Uh, and now we are at the same stage with, with production. Uh, the, the personal computer and open source software and, and so 
uh, software which uh, also became available all over the world and shared and you can build upon the software of others and improve it and customize it to your needs and so on. Uh, the same, so th this led to a, a democratization of information. So every one of us uh, can take part. You can access information uh, wherever you are, whatever you want, but not only access information, not only consume information, but we also are producers of information. By the push of a button, you can now, uh, you can now be a publisher. You can publish your thoughts via Twitter, via Facebook, uh, on your website, on Wikipedia, wherever you want. Uh, and the same becomes now true for, for the world of things, for the world of atoms, not only for the world of information and bits and bytes. And this is the much larger economy. And this is what's really, uh, how, what's really affects our, our lives. Uh, and as we heard in the morning session, uh, Tommy spoke about the 3D printers. So the 3D printers are rather a symbol for, for the personal fabrication in contrast to personal computers. Uh, personal fabrication, it is in fact much more than just 3D printers. It means that digital fabrication machines become accessible. This means I draw my ideas on a computer and then I send it to a machine and the machine can produce it. This is also not new. These machines, CNC milling machines, also 3D printers are 40 years old. Uh, but now they become cheaper, they become affordable, they become uh, accessible. And so the next step will be uh, that we are not just consumers anymore of things, we become also producers. And we can share our designs on the internet, we can download the, de the designs of others, uh, we can modify them, we can improve them, uh, we can uh, share our uh, inventions, and so on and so on. And the same uh, will now happen with the things, what's happened in the last decades uh, with the information, and it will come to a democratization of the means of production. Uh, but, of course, the important thing is that we have access to these machines. And now the question is, uh, is 3D printers using laser cutters, is this just a hobby of a few nerds? Uh, what, we, what we see is, this is just a number of the make affairs, which is a, uh, most of you might have heard about it, is a uh, big exhibition and workshops uh, of makers worldwide. Uh, and you see the number is growing exponentially. But not only this, uh, also the number of, of open workshops of Fab Labs are growing exponentially. Uh, the number of members in my Fab Lab, uh, the diagram would look, uh, would have the same shape. Uh, so it's a worldwide, a worldwide movement. Uh, we can call it uh, the next industrial revolution or we can a bit less dramatic call it the maker movement. And the maker movement, uh, this poster was published recently on the Gromit blog, uh, which says the maker movement is shaping the future of our economy. And what is in particular interesting is uh, these numbers are for the, for the United States, but I think uh, they are not that much different here. Uh, that two out of three new jobs are based on this, on this maker on this maker movement. In fact, the natural resources we have here is not, is not oil, is not gas, uh, is our creativity. And if we find a way so that people can make use of their ideas, their uh, innovation power, their creativity, without uh, big barriers on a low threshold level, uh, then something big will happen and uh, we are seeing now that this is what generates new jobs, sustainable jobs. And another study I have found last week uh, supports this, uh, that the new jobs are coming from new, young, 
uh, and innovative companies. Uh, in fact, only the, <coughs> the young companies uh, create, uh, create jobs. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to find a way to uh, engage people, to motivate people to try out their ideas. And one guy who very early uh, uh, saw this coming is uh, this guy's Professor Neil Gershenfeld from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's head of the Center for Bits and Atoms. And that's interesting. I mean, it's the transformation process from the bits to the atoms. Uh, and uh, he introduced the term Fab Lab in 2002 and uh, set up the first Fab Lab at the MIT uh, in 2002, uh, giving the students access uh, to digital fabrication machines, to, to, to tools uh, which enable them to make almost anything. That's the goal, uh, to have a set of tools uh, freely accessible, accessible to everybody uh, where you can make almost anything, and the almost is in, in brackets. And Fab Labs are not just a local workshop. Fab Labs are a global network of local workshops. It's, al it's also important to know by now, we have more than 400 Fab Labs all over the world. I think in Ireland there are two, but none of them in Dublin, as far as I know. Yeah? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and there is a, there is a very Fab Lab-like workshop here, uh, I think, in, a, in another, on another other floor here. Uh, yeah, and but all the all the labs are working independently, and they are uh, all about to find their way how to how, how to uh, operate sustainable. Uh, so it's still in progress. There is not the the one and only uh, model how to operate a fab lab, and that's also an important and interesting thing. And and we meet once a year at the annual conference, the last, the last annual uh, conference, the Fab 10, was held in, in Barcelona, which, by the way, uh, uh, wants to move from Fab Lab to Fab City. Uh, the mayor of Barcelona uh, agreed on stage. Uh, so they, they spent $2 million to set up a Fab Lab in each district, uh, and they want to become self-sustainable city by the uh, by the use of, of, of Fab Labs, uh, they want to go away from the uh, products in garbage out principle. So now we import products into the city and then uh, we export the garbage after we've used it. They want to come to a, a DIDO principle, data in, data out, which means we make use of our creativity. Uh, we share uh, the designs the innovations via the internet, we import it via the internet, uh, and we produce it locally. We produce it locally where we need it. So this is a, a long-term goal. They want to reach this goal by, I think, in 30 years. So we will see what, what will happen. But, but it's a vision. Uh, and we started with a, with a happy lab in Vienna uh, four years ago, and we were quite surprised how successful uh, it is because by now we have uh, 1,500 regular users. They pay uh, a monthly membership fee, which is quite low, but it's rather a commitment. Uh, and they are working in the lab on Christmas presents, on prototypes for businesses, on uh, do their work for, for the university project. It's, it's, very, uh, it's varying a lot. And yeah, we have tools like 3D printers. We've heard a lot about them. But for me, it's important to say uh, three print, 3D printers are, we read a lot and hear a lot about 3D printers now, but it's, not, it's, it's, it's a kind of symbol for this maker movement. Uh, but many, many users come to us with a, uh, because they want to see a 3D printer in action. They want to try it out. But after that, 
they end up at the laser cutter or at the CNC mill uh, or at the vinyl plotter and make their own cool T-shirts. Uh, so it's it's a bit like with a with a microwave oven when uh, when it was invented. Uh, people thought that time okay this is this will be a, revol a revolution to the kitchen. So this is the, the new kitchen. The, the microwave is, 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 is better, faster, more energy efficient. Uh, the food will be healthier and I don't know. Uh, but then we saw that in, in, in every kitchen now, we have all the old tools plus the microwave. And the same is true with a 3D printer. Uh, the workshop will have an additional tool, which is good for some applications, uh, but there are still many applications that uh, or many, many, uh, yeah, we can make easier and better with the old tools. So, yeah, and many in, uh, innovations uh, have electronics inside, so we also have a, an electronics workbench where you can produce your own printed circuit boards. And, of course, the machines do not all the work for us. Uh, it's still needed to have a hammer and, and, and screwdrivers and old-fashioned tools. But all these tools and machines are nothing if we don't know how to use them. And it's particularly important uh, to say that nobody of us has to be afraid of using a 3D printer or a, uh, a milling machine or, or a laser cutter. It's so easy, it's much easier. To cut plywood with a laser cutter is much easier than with a jigsaw. Uh, and we provide trainings, free trainings. You need not to register for the training, you just drop by. And we have initial courses for all the machines and within one hour training, you are able to produce your first uh, piece of work on a machine. So it's easy and we provide more sophisticated trainings uh, from this one, one hour trainings uh, up to a one semester course, which is very interesting, I think. It's the Fab Academy, it's a distributed course where about 20 Fab Labs all over the globe uh, participate. Uh, it's led by the MIT uh, and it's a, it's a mix of distance learning in a virtual classroom. We all are uh, connected, we all are linked together via vi a video conferencing system. So there is a lecture uh, broadcasted via this video conferencing system, but then you have to do the assignments in the local lab with the local supervisors. Uh, and the title of this course is, of course, how to build, how to build almost anything. And uh, if we combine the, the access to the machines and to the knowledge, uh, then here are just a few a few pictures what's possible then uh, and I want to pick out just a few of the uh, of the success stories or the uh, the things which have been made in Happy Lab for instance uh, this is a low-cost water disinfection uh, tool so in fact water disinfection is done by the UV radiation but this tool you mount it on the on the uh, pet bottles and there is a, an, a display on it with a smiley and the smiley smiles uh, when the amount of radiation is, uh, is right so that you can drink, you can drink the water. Uh, they started playing around with the electronics, with the housing uh, of, of this tool and uh, then they tried, when they had the, their prototype ready they tried to get funding and they got and now they've produced a series of 200,000 pieces. So I, I would say they've never, they would have, wouldn't have started with this project if they wouldn't have had this low threshold access to tools uh, that, that we provide. Uh, another interesting project is this one, Rough Boards. Uh, it's an upcycling project. They uh, use old snowboards and make skateboards, longboards out of, out of it. Uh, individual uh, boards and it's not just an upcycling project, they also uh, give ex-cons the chance to, for a new start 
uh, and they do, they're in cooperation with some NGOs, and so they, they work for them. Uh, this is also an interesting story. A designer who played around with plexiglass on the laser cutter, uh, different shapes and bending, and uh, came up with, with this fortune cookie uh, shape uh, and makes now fortune cookie jewelries. Uh, it's a, a very nice uh, present if you don't have one for Christmas uh, because you can, you can uh, place the, the individual wish inside, of course. And what's also interesting is not just, not just uh, the cookies made in our lab, but also uh, the box is, is designed and made on the laser cutter. Yeah, uh, that's just a few impressions. Uh, and I'm very looking forward to, to a discussion. And I just want to say to all of you, realize, materialize your ideas. It's never been that easy as it is now. Just, just do it. <laughs>